Hello and welcome to Hadley Temple Online Worship. We're so pleased to see you. It's amazing that you want to be part of this fellowship and we'd encourage you to listen also to Discipleship, our After Hours Going Deeper episode that gives us the chance to work out what God's saying to us in this lockdown situation. God speaks very specifically into our lives and as we delve into the issues of faith this morning, we want you to be blessed, challenged and moved to action. James says that faith without deeds is dead. So this online gathered community has to be about moving from intention to action. Abraham and Sarah give us a powerful picture of faith worked out in everyday life. How do we transform those inspirational words into behaviour and action? It's about giving our all. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Love for God is a great place to start. So let's sing.
Glory, glory, Jesus saves me. Glory to the Lamb. As we move to prayer and continue in worship, we're taken by the intimacy of relationship. He speaks his words of love and we're stunned to find out that he loves us. I'm captured by your holy calling. I know you're drawing me to yourself. I give my life to the potter's hand. A prayer. Gracious Father, as we turn to you, we're aware that our prayer life is not always as intense as we would like. Even in these days that go at a vastly different pace to normal, 
we're still struggling to find quality time to be with you. We ask for your forgiveness. We also want to resolve to spend more time with you. We want to stay close. When we are close, it's easier to feel you move and to respond to your spirit. You bless us already in numerous ways, but our prayer is that we become more available to you, more open to be used by you. We want to make a difference, Lord. Help us to make a good difference. Help us change the world in ways that demonstrate your love very clearly to others, so that they cannot help but ask us about why we follow your way. We want to pass your blessing on to others. Help us, we pray. Amen.
Genesis 18 verses 1 to 14. God appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent. It was the hottest part of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing. He ran from his tent to greet them and bowed before them. He said, Master, if it please you, stop for a while with your servant. I'll get some water so that you can wash your feet. Rest under this tree. I'll get some food to refresh you on your way, since your travels have brought you across my path. They said, certainly, go ahead. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. He said, hurry, get three cups of our best flour, knead it and make bread. Then Abraham ran to the cattle pen and picked out a nice plump calf and gave it to the servant who lost no time getting it ready. Then he got curds and milk, brought them with the calf that had been roasted, set the meal before the men and stood there under the tree while they ate it. The men said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? He said, In the tent. One of them said, I'm coming back about this time next year. When I arrive, your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent opening just behind the man. Abraham and Sarah were old by this time, very old. Sarah was far past the age for having babies. Sarah laughed within herself. An old woman like me get pregnant with this old man of a husband. God said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh saying me have a baby, an old woman like me? Is anything too hard for God? I'll be back about this time next year and Sarah will have a baby.
What's your investment portfolio like? If you put money into a solid investment, you expect that the reward will come. How about a riskier investment? Expectations change. The rewards might be greater, but there's an accompanying risk that you could lose everything. How about faith in God? Is that a risky or a sure thing? Let's see from the example of Abraham and Sarah. Hebrews assures us that they had great faith. Abraham trusted God, and when God told him to leave home and go far away to another land that he promised to give him, Abraham obeyed. Away he went, not even knowing where he was going. Sarah too had faith, and because of this she was able to become a mother in spite of her old age, for she realised that God, who gave her his promise, would certainly do what he said. 25 years previous to this, Abraham was living a comfortable, respectable, if somewhat predictable life with his family when God told him to go to, well, you'll see. When someone says, leave everything and go to a place, I'll show you, but I'm not telling you where, it would actually inspire alarm in most of us, wouldn't it? Alarm, not faith, would be the presenting issue at this point. But Abraham said, OK. When we get to the part of the story covered by today's reading, we come across a man still waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. 25 years later, the guy's 100 years old and living in a tent in dry desert heat. I think we need to contemplate this picture for a moment. Even in lockdown, think how relatively comfortable our lives are. Our world's been turned upside down. Nothing's like it was 13 weeks ago. Everything's changed. Massive upheaval, imposed separation, financial challenge, employment concerns, and no one really knows when this will end. Abraham took his family on a wild journey from Iraq to Israel because God said so. He also told him he was going to be the father of a great nation. And 25 years later, he was 100 and his wife was 90 and there was still no family. Not 13 weeks of uncertainty, but 25 years travelling to a place they didn't know waiting for a family they didn't have. Our situation's not great, but Abraham and Sarah, that is a different proposition altogether. I want to talk about compartmentalization. Abraham and Sarah risked everything. They put their whole lives into following God with no guarantee. If we're not careful, we compartmentalise our faith. In the religion box, we have Sunday worship. We go to the hall, sing songs and pray prayers, worship God, and then we go home. When we live the rest of our lives, it sort of gets put in a different box. One set of behaviours for church, another for the rest of life. The faith is reduced to this proposition, Jesus save me and I'm going to heaven when I die. But for the rest of life, not quite sure how to fit him into this. Does our faith in Jesus get any traction with the real issues of life? Don't forget that Abraham and Sarah, great faith heroes that they most definitely are, struggled with compartmentalization too. They decided that servant girl Hagar was needed to help God out. On the one hand they were trusting God to fulfill his promises, on the other using finite knowledge they thought the only way to continue Abraham's line was to have a servant girl bear him children. What's it like for us? On the one hand God makes great promises. You are Peter, 
a stone and upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell shall not prevail against it. And we look at our church and say, it's so old. How can we build? If we believe Jesus does what he promises, that he'll build his church, all we have to do is be faithful to that promise. The powers of hell won't be able to stop it. I think that the Christian community of which I'm a part compartmentalizes faith and the world. The Abraham and Sarah story shows both how hard it is to trust without wavering and how wonderful the rewards are for those who continue to trust. Faith investment is risky. Trusting in God means that we have to put everything on the line. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. This is not optional just for the spiritual heroes among us. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. If we compartmentalise, we're chopping up our existence and not allowing God access into every area. Let me tell you, the sacred secular divide is a man-made distinction and does not exist. If I think there is a divide, I legitimate dividing my brain and therefore my life into religious and non-religious zones. There's a bit for God. Here you are, God. But this bit's mine. Can't have it. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit or stand. When far away you know my every thought. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. You know what I'm going to say before I even say it. You both proceed and follow me and place your hand of blessing on my head. Just look at that and see how full on God's commitment is to us. We can't escape his love or take ourselves out of his care means that all to Jesus I freely give is non-negotiable. We cannot look at the gift God gives of all that he is and give him 50 or 60 percent of our lives. I said it last week, but only worship gets us to the place where we properly understand how ridiculous it is to give God anything but the best, anything less than all. Abraham and Sarah show us both the dangers of compartmentalising and the rewards of fully trusting. They tried it the Hagar way and they tried it the Sarah way. The takeaway for me is it doesn't matter if you trip up and try in your own strength. Keep trusting and try again. Proverbs 21. A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. We must certainly employ our own common sense, but the Spirit of God has to become a voice that we train ourselves to listen to and recognise and follow. Imagine a 100-year-old man. Think about Captain Tom Moore walking around his garden. Abraham, in a very warm climate, at the opening to his tent, is having an afternoon siesta. Chilled, half asleep, when he sees three strangers approach. We know about Middle Eastern hospitality about how it's culturally unacceptable to ignore passing travellers. 
It was part of his psyche to want to help such people. But this is crazy. Verse 2. He suddenly noticed three men coming toward him. He sprang up and ran to meet them and welcomed them. Verse 6. Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, Quick, mix up some pancakes. Then he ran out to the herd and selected a fat calf and told a servant to hurry and butcher it. Still got a picture of Tom Moore? What I'm trying to say is that 25 years of waiting and by his body language alone, we can tell that Abraham knows he's in the presence, not just of a special guest, but of the Lord himself. Faith is not passive. Faith is an active pursuit. So even when Abraham's half asleep, his spirit within alerts him to the fact that someone special's here, someone special who needs to be ministered to. 25 years of faith prepared him for this and many other similar moments. Giving his all was a necessary prerequisite. Does exercising faith mean that we're more aware of the divine presence in our lives? A presence that's always there, but one that's easy to miss. We can't compartmentalise. We mustn't compartmentalise. We can't afford to give Jesus less than he gives us, at least. If we do get stingy around God, we can't expect to be in a place where he can pour on us all the blessings he's planned for us. What a waste that would be. What do you think? Is Jesus a risky or a solid investment? The way we lead our lives shows we have already made a judgment on this. I'm not talking about investing so we're assured of the joys of heaven when we die. I'm talking about a life in its fullness here and now. Only full investment reaps these amazing benefits. Jesus is building his church. The stones are those fully invested people with nothing held back. It's the only way to go. Look at Sarah and Abraham. Are we those living stones? Are we those fully invested people with nothing held back? The discipleship we're encouraging you to go deeper with, the closer walk with Jesus, is not really a choice. We're all invited to go deeper with Jesus and there are steps we have to take. And yes, we really do have to take them now. It's not about pressuring you. It's about looking around us, seeing that the world is still blighted with racial tension, still full of people who need help. That help is really best given by a person whose heart is given to transformation. Help is one thing. Being helped by someone who's trying to be like Jesus, well, that's another thing altogether. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. Close to God, invested in going deeper. As we worship, working out what further steps we must take. Let's sing.
Let's pray. Spirit of truth, hear the desire of your children. We want to make a difference. We want to bless and be blessed. And so help us to hear you. Help us to be positioned best so we can effectively be there for others. You call us to selfless action. You say we must die to self and live for you. It's a big thing you call us to, but nothing that you haven't done first yourself. Let us praise you in song and by our worship. And may we praise you by doing your will. Amen. Our last song together is O Thou God of My Salvation, which speaks of the angels that Abraham perceived. May our sensitivities be increased that we too are more aware of the spiritual realm. Angels hovering round us, unperceived amid the throng, wondering at the love that found us, glad to join our holy song. See if you can hear them. Be blessed in your service for the Master this week. The lockdown continues, although the conditions are changing by the day. Open your hearts to the Lord so that he would show you wonderful things, new ways of being in this new world. Pray for opportunities to reach people in surprising ways. Feel his presence and lift your heart in thanksgiving. Thanks again for stopping by. Have a great week. See you soon. A blessing. May the love of God, the presence of Jesus and the power of the Spirit constantly remind you of their existence in you. May their blessing work its way through your lives so that all your interactions are filled with peace. Blessings be on you both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.